In this session of Standing Free, we're going to be talking about something that at first might seem a little too theoretical and not too practical. But the truth is, everything we'll do practically in this class hangs upon the truth of what we'll be talking about here in the next hour or so. What we're going to be looking at is what theologians call the atonement. Uh, what it is that Jesus did to bring us salvation. But there's a way of looking at the atonement that highlights spiritual warfare from beginning to the end. What it really does is it shows us that if we look at Jesus' life, death, and resurrection properly, we see that the entire time Jesus was on this planet, he was actually doing spiritual warfare. And so not only can we learn from him some of the things that we'll be talking about today, but just as importantly, we'll be seeing that the only reason and way we can do spiritual warfare today is because of the warfare Jesus has already done. We'll see that really we're doing warfare from a position of Jesus having already won the war. In Jesus' already but not yet kingdom, Jesus has already won the decisive battle that turned the entire war in the direction of the kingdom of God. That's what we're going to be exploring today. Now, uh, through church history, as Christians have tried to understand what is it Jesus did to, to bring us salvation, freedom, liberation, deliverance, all those things, uh, there's been three major uh, ways of coming at that question. You might call them three different uh, paradigms or models of the atonement. Uh, one's called the objective model. And what this focuses on is what God had to do as creator and righteous judge in order to make salvation possible. You could think of the objective view as sort of a Godward view. What is it about God that required atonement? And here you might think of verses such as uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, where it says that uh, Jesus, who knew no sin, was made to be sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And now, in this sense, the objective model talks about how Jesus took our sin and gave us this, this new life of, of forgiveness. Uh, the second model is known as the subjective model, and this focuses on humans. So what is it about us that required atonement. If the objective model is sort of a Godward focus, the subjective model is more of a human word focus. What is it that the, the work of Jesus does to woo us to God? And so the atonement model uh, that comes out of subjective sort of a paradigm will talk about the way that, that Jesus' life and death show us the love of God, that God reveals to us in the life and death of Jesus just how deeply and passionately he cares for us. And that, that should melt our hearts. It should draw us towards God, our, our heavenly groom. Now, both of those perspectives are absolutely there in the Bible, and they're important to consider. Today, we're going to focus on a third model. And it's one that's often been neglected, at least in the last thousand years of church history. Interestingly, it was the dominant model in the first thousand years of church history. It's typically called the Christus Victor model. And it's primarily asking the question, how does what Jesus did defeat the kingdom of darkness? How does what Jesus did have a Satanward view? Um, it comes, for, for example, to, to a, a, a pinpoint with this verse. 1 John 3.8 says this, The Son of God was revealed for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. So here, the Christus Victor view says, we've got to understand and appreciate how the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus undid the kingdom of darkness. It's very much a spiritual warfare focus to this model, which is why we're, we have it as an entire session in our Standing Free class. It's going to propose that from the moment Jesus was born until the moment he ascended up into heaven, 
the entire uh, childhood, uh, adolescence, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension. The whole thing of Jesus' life as a human being was for the purpose of defeating Satan, liberating us from his bondage, and setting us free to actually be the, the liberated children of God that we were designed to be. So let's do this. We'll kind of walk through the life of Jesus and see how the Christus Victor model appears really everywhere you look. In fact, we'll start even before the life of Jesus. In fact, let's go back to the first book of the Bible, one of the very earliest chapters, and see that already in the fall of the garden with Adam and Eve, God is already talking in what we could call Christus Victor sorts of ways about the coming Messiah. Genesis 3.15 says this. Now the context, of course, is Adam and Eve have just eaten of the tree, of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, what they weren't supposed to touch or to, to eat, and uh, they have. They, they've, they've rebelled against God. And one of the things God says to them as he's uh, describing what life will be like in the world after the fall, and it's all pretty bleak, relationships with God destroyed, with each other destroyed, even with the creation, relationships have been destroyed. In the midst of this, God gives a beautiful promise. And he does it as he's talking to the serpent. And he says this, God speaking to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. And he shall bruise you on the head though you shall bruise him on the heel. This verse, Genesis 3.15, is known as the Proto-Evangelium, which really just means first gospel. It's really the first time we hear the, the glimmering light of the gospel message, that God will send a Messiah, a, a seed of the woman, someone who's fully human, but it turns out also going to be fully God. And this this Messiah will crush the head of the serpent, meaning will defeat the kingdom of darkness and all of the evil powers that Satan has at work in this world. We also see it in other Old Testament themes. Uh, here's a very uh, important verse, one of the most frequently quoted verses by early Christians from the Old Testament. It's Psalms 110 verse 1, and it says this, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Now, the, the image of, a, of making an enemy a footstool for one's feet was, a, was an image from the ancient world. And it was really talking about the, the subjugation, uh, the defeat of an enemy, and sort of the humiliating position of having to be a footstool for the, 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 the victorious king. So God uses this imagery to talk about the future Messiah's victory over his enemy, Satan. And the early church, again, often referred to this as talking about Jesus or prophesying about Jesus' coming victory. Let's turn to the life of Jesus now. Um, here's a verse. We'll start with Luke 1, 4. Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan, of course, referring to where Jesus had just been baptized by John the Baptist. He returned from the Jordan and was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. So here's a fascinating uh, fact about Jesus, that before he could minister, before he preached his first sermon, he first was led from the waters of the baptism to the wilderness to have this really this contest with Satan. Um, it turns out that the very three temptations that we're told about in both Matthew 4 and Luke 4, that Jesus faced with Satan in the wilderness, those same three temptations were faced by Israel in, 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 in different forms, but the same kind of temptations. Will they trust God or not? Were faced by the nation of Israel way back in Exodus. And where, where the, uh, the, the Israelites failed in those temptations, the Son of God, Jesus, he succeeds. He stays faithful. 
And what we see in this moment is that the primary way that Jesus did spiritual warfare for the first 30 years of his life, again, we don't have much information on the first 30 years of Jesus' life, right? In the Gospels, we're told about his birth. We're told about an incident at age 12. And then after that, we really don't hear much until he's about 30 and starting his ministry. But what we see in this temptation is that all of Jesus' life, every day he woke up, uh, when he was 7, when he was 14, when he was 18, the year he was uh, 26, right up until his ministry at about age 30, every day, like you and I, Jesus was facing temptations and he was overcoming them. He was remaining faithful to his father. He was an obedient son, unlike the nation of Israel. And every time he said yes to the father and no to Satan, that was defeating Satan at the most fundamental level. He was, as Jesus taught us to pray, um, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. See, the kingdom of God for Jesus is simply wherever God's will is being done. And wherever God's will is being done, Satan's will is not being done. And so the kingdom of darkness is dying. Jesus was the mustard seed. Because everywhere Jesus went, he simply obeyed the Father, which was doing the Father's will on earth, which was coming against, therefore, the kingdom of darkness and Satan's will. Every choice of obedience that Jesus made through his 30 years, 33 years as a human being was an active assault on the kingdom of darkness. He was doing spiritual warfare for us through obedience. When we turn to Jesus' ministry now, we can see the same theme here. All throughout his ministry, Jesus structured it as an assault on the kingdom of darkness. Here's how Peter uh, summarized Jesus' entire ministry in one verse. It comes from Acts 10, verse 38. It says this, Now you know Jesus of Nazareth, how God anointed him with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil. So for Peter, when he thinks, how do I summarize Jesus' ministry? It's, well, everywhere that there was oppression by Satan, Jesus came into that situation and brought life and healing and really the love of God against the kingdom of the enemy. You know, when we look at it this way, we can see that every element of Jesus' daily ministry that we read in the Gospels was a strategic plan to undo Satan and his kingdom of darkness. In the, in the, in the Jewish worldview of, of that time, Jews knew the characteristics of the kingdom of darkness. It was things like this. If you looked around you and saw sin, or uh, evil spirits, or sickness, or darkness and deception, or death, the ultimate enemy, well then you knew the kingdom of darkness was at play because those are the powers of Satan. Satan specializes in sin, deception, disease, demons, and death. But they also know that when the kingdom of God arrives with the Messiah, those powers will be done away and replaced by the powers of the kingdom of God. Instead of, instead of evil spirits, it'll be the Holy Spirit. Instead of sin, it'll be right covenant relationships, proper relationship. Instead of disease, it'll be wholeness and health. Instead of demons, we, as we talked about, it will not be uh, people being infested or, or demonized. It'll be the Spirit of God coming into and living in residence of people's hearts and lives. And instead of deception and darkness, it'll be truth and light. Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life. Instead of death, it'll be life and resurrection. And that's exactly how Jesus does his ministry, right? When Jesus sees sin, he brings forgiveness and right relationship. When he sees demons, he casts them out and brings the Holy Spirit to, to residence in people's lives. When he sees um, disease, he heals it. 
Whenever Jesus finds deception and darkness, he brings light and truth, speaking the truth in, in all of his teachings. And when Jesus sees dead people, he sees things not the way they're supposed to be, and he rise, raises them up from the dead. Not all dead people, right? But there's certain moments where Jesus will, will take someone who's actually succumbed to the, the very powers of death, and Jesus will raise them up as the first fruits the evidence that the general resurrection is coming when all will be raised from the dead at his return. So Jesus' entire ministry is one giant assault on the kingdom of darkness. Next, we're going to look at the cross. How is it that Jesus' death brings freedom from the enemy? In a lot of ways, this is where the New Testament focuses much of its energy on Jesus' spiritual warfare against the enemy. Um, let me start with this verse here, Hebrews 2, 14 and 15. Since humans are made of flesh and blood, Jesus himself also came to earth as flesh and blood, so that through his death he could take away the power of him who had the power of death, that is, the devil. And in this way, he's liberated us who, because of our fear of death, had lived in bondage to Satan. So according to the author of Hebrews, a significant central feature of Jesus' death is that some way it takes the power of death away from Satan himself and liberates us in the process. Now, there's a number of themes through the New Testament we could look at, and we'll touch on several of them right now, that emphasize that in different ways Jesus was preparing and at the cross finally defeating the kingdom of darkness. One of the themes is that often when Jesus would encounter a demonized person, the demons would speak through the person and they would act surprised. Maybe you remember some of those passages where the demons would say things like, uh, Son of God, why are you here? Have you come to torment us before our time? They, they just couldn't figure out why the Son of God would come in human form and confront them as a human being. They were, it completely caught them off guard, it seems. Then, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 7 and 8, it actually says, according to the Apostle Paul here, that if the, the, the powers, the principalities and powers, the, the evil spiritual rulers, the, the fallen angels, had known that Jesus' plan of the cross was going to do what it did, they never would have crucified him, it says. It turns out uh, that they didn't understand love. The enemy is pretty smart, but apparently the idea of self-sacrificial, other-oriented agape love entirely is missed by him. Because when God came as a human being out of love to liberate us through his self-sacrificial death, the enemy just didn't see that coming. Didn't realize that in killing Jesus, he wasn't going to get rid of Jesus. He was going to liberate us. It completely backfired on him. Now, this leads us to ask the question, what exactly is it about Jesus' death that brought the liberation? Why, why did Jesus have to die in order for us to be liberated? The closest thing we have to a complete answer on this in the New Testament, I believe, is Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 to 15. It says this, and when you were dead in your sins, God made you alive together with Jesus, having forgiven us all our sins. Here's how he did it. He canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us. And having nailed it to the cross, he disarmed the rulers and authorities, these are the principalities and powers, or the, the fallen angels that had influence over us. He uh, disarmed them 
making a public display of them by triumphing over them through Jesus. Now, that gets kind of wordy there, and it's, it's referring to some things that first century people were familiar with, but not so much us. For example, nailing something to a cross. W what was nailed? Well, we think of Jesus being nailed, and that's true. But also, as we read from the Gospels, there was something else nailed to the cross, namely, the person's crime that got them crucified would be nailed on a little uh, placard to the cross above their head. Jesus, of course, said, uh, King of the Jews, right? The idea being that he was claiming to be a, a king who could threaten Pilate, and so that's why Pilate had to execute him. But it appears that whoever was crucified, they would have a, a, a little board above their head with their sins or their crimes written on it. So Paul's using that analogy and saying, it's as if God took all of our sins that we have done and nailed them to Jesus's cross so that it's not my sin any longer, but Jesus, in essence, takes responsibility for your and my sin and nails it to his cross. And once it's nailed there and Jesus dies for it, well, then he has delivered us from the death consequence of our rebellion against God. You see, it turns out the only power the enemy had over us was that we had said no to God. And when you say no to God, even though you don't realize it, you're saying yes to the enemy and to his kingdom because he is the Lord of the kingdom of rebels. And so to rebel against God is to place yourself under the authority of the enemy. And the only way to get back from that authority and give it back to God is to have the sins, the disobedience, the rebellion died for by someone, either ourselves or in this case, Jesus. And Jesus says, I will die your death for you. Yes, when you broke covenant against God, you deserve death. Let me absorb your death into my own crucifixion and liberate you so that no longer does Satan have something to hold over you. You are liberated from the guilt of the rebellion. And now we can dislocate ourselves from the kingdom of darkness and re-engage in the kingdom of God. That is the beauty of the cross. In forgiving sin, it also liberates us from the kingdom of sin. And it doesn't stop there. Jesus died to liberate us. He also, three days later, rose from the dead to liberate us. Through his resurrection, he defeats the power of death, which is Satan's last final stronghold. We now see in Jesus that the first human being has defeated death, and Jesus says to us, anyone who's in him, who's joined themselves to Jesus, also shall be liberated from death. Our bodies, too, will rise someday. The enemy literally can do nothing to us that will not be reversed when Jesus returns and our bodies rise from the dead and live forever in the kingdom of God. And it doesn't stop there. Jesus, on his last day on earth, uh, was gathered around by his disciples, and it says they saw him rising up and literally ascending to the throne of God. Now, you and I, in our modern world, you know, might wonder, uh, where exactly did he go? You know, is straight up really like, is heaven just north of Pluto or something? And of course, no, heaven is what we would probably call in another dimension of space and time. But from an ancient world perspective, this would have made a lot of sense to them. You see, in the ancient world, they thought of the heavens, uh, meaning anything above earth, is really involving three spheres. Paul even refers to the third heaven in, in one of his uh, uh, chapters, in, in chapter uh, 12 of, of 2 Corinthians. He talks about a vision he had of the third heaven. Well, what's the first heaven and the second heaven? Here's how they thought of it. What they called the first heaven is what you and I would say is the atmosphere surrounding earth. It's, it's where birds fly. That's kind of the lower heavens, where, where birds fly. Uh, the second heavens would be where angels and demons live. Now, from their perspective of the ancient world, that was kind of where the stars were. And then beyond the stars somewhere, 
they imagined that that's where God's throne room was, the third heaven, where God lives. So you could think of the, it as the first heaven is, is where birds live, the second heaven, angels and demons, and the third heaven, God's very throne room. And what happens is as Jesus rises up from the earth and ascends to the throne of God, in the ancient person's mindset, they were realizing that was saying Jesus was going through the first heaven, through the second heaven, up to the very third heaven of God. And now Jesus is over, meaning has authority over the other two heavens. This was a way that God could help ancient people understand that he was now over all things, that all things were literally beneath the feet of Jesus. Jesus had ascended to the very authority and power and victory of God himself. And that meant that every demon and every fallen angel in the second heaven was under the authority of Jesus. A powerful way to talk about victory in the ancient world. So let's summarize things here. Summarize our salvation from this perspective and what this means for you and me as we engage in spiritual warfare in this world. Here's one way of summarizing everything that Jesus did for us. Really what God's plan was, what happened in the fall, and how Jesus has repaired that. Our purpose, as stated in Genesis chapter 1 and 2, when God thought human being, he thought, my image. That creature that I will create in my image, and remember, to image the triune God, who is love, is to be someone who loves. When God thought image, he thought people, human beings, who will have the kind of loving relationships together that I have within my triune being, Father, Son, and Spirit, loving each other. You and I are called to our most fundamental job description of loving God and each other with the kind of love that God is. Now, of course, within the third chapter of the Bible, our first parents, Adam and Eve, decided not to do that. Instead of loving God and each other, they rebelled against God, had a power struggle with each other, and eventually lost the entire creation that they were supposed to steward and care for. See, what they didn't realize is that in saying no to God, they were saying yes to the enemy. This is why Satan is called all throughout scripture things like God of this world, prince of this age, um, that all the world lies under the power of the evil one, 1 John 5, 19. You might think, how did things get so bad? Answer, God gave us the creation to care for and we decided to take it, say no to God and say yes to the enemy, which means we invited the enemy to take our stewardship position over the earth. Kind of explains why this world looks as if Satan is running it. He is. At least he was fully until Jesus broke in and begun the already but not yet kingdom. We'll come back to that in a minute. But that's our, our, our calling, is to love as God loves and to steward the earth as God stewards the universe. In the fall, we said no to God and yes to the enemy. The enemy gained control. Jesus now steps into that situation. He has to repair our covenant with the Father. He has to defeat the enemies that we handed the creation over to. And that's precisely what he does. He came as a new Adam. He lived our life for us, being an obedient, faithful human being, never falling into sin as we do, living our life for us that we cannot live, our covenant-keeping life. Then he died our covenant-breaking death for us when he didn't deserve it, the only human who's never deserved to die. And by doing that, he says to us, take my life as I take your death. It's the great exchange, the beautiful exchange of agape love. I'll give you my faithful life. I'll take your covenant-breaking death and die it for you, Jesus says. And then he rises from the dead to defeat our enemies, ascends to heaven to have authority over all things, so that when Jesus on the cross, 
utters those beautiful words, it is finished, he means it. Living our life, dying our death, defeating our enemies, Satan and his entire kingdom of darkness, even ascending to the throne of God and ruling over all things on our behalf. Jesus has done it all. This is why the only option we have is a response of, gracious, of, of gratitude, a response of faith to his grace. Now, what that means is in defeating the enemy, Jesus has both freed us from some things and freed us for other things, right? He's freed us from sin, from the guilt that comes with that and the shame that can come with that. He frees us from Satan. He even frees us from death itself. Our bodies will be resurrected someday. But he doesn't just free us from things, he frees us for things. He frees us for a covenant with the Father again. Frees us for covenant love relationships with each other. He frees us for missional kingdom work in this world. To, to take this beautiful message, to take this love, and to literally trailblaze in this world, bringing the kingdom to places it is not fully yet realized in. This is the calling of the kingdom of God. To wrap this all up, we could say this, that in Christ, anyone who said yes to Jesus, we experience Jesus' victory and his authority over the enemy. Now, this is where it gets practical. Anytime you and I are dealing with spiritual warfare, whether it's taking thoughts captive in our own brain, whether it's freeing others from works of the enemy, whatever it might be, the only way we can do that is by stepping into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, sharing that with him, being in Christ, and then speaking and acting out of his victory and his authority over the enemy. Let me read a few words from Colossians. So from Colossians chapter 1, verses 13 to 20, it says this, For God delivered us from the domain of darkness, right, the kingdom of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his dear son, to the kingdom of Jesus, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. For the son, Jesus, created all things, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. Now these are all names for angelic creatures. Uh, rulers, dominions, thrones, authorities. Jesus created all of them. The Son did. All these things have been created by him and for him. Even those that have rebelled against him were originally created by him to love and serve. And he is before all things. In him all things hold together. It's just talking about how Jesus really is the center of everything. He's the head of the body, the church. For it was the Father's good pleasure for the fullness to dwell in the Son and through him to reconcile all things to himself. He made peace with all things through the blood of the Son. So in other words, the Son, Jesus, before he came to earth, while he was still just a part of the triune God, created and made all things in agape love. And when things fell apart because of sin, that very same son stepped into a human realm and repaired everything needed to be uh, reversing things back to the kingdom of God. Jesus, in other words, is the key to all spiritual warfare. Now, turning to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 6, now we see where we fit into this. Paul says this to us, You were dead in your trespasses and sins, which you formerly walked in, according to the ways of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. That's a title for Satan. Prince or Lord over the air. Right? That's second heaven. Among you, we all were formerly living that sort of life, indulging in the sinful desires of the flesh. 
But God, being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he's loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, saved us. And, now here's the key, and he raised us up to be seated with Jesus in the heavenly places. Ah, this is why you and I can move into any situation of spiritual warfare and have absolute confidence. Not because we're powerful, not because we have the right techniques, not because we've read the right book on how to deal with demons. None of that. One simple reason. Because you and I, in Christ, simply speak to these things and deal with these things and deal with our own thoughts in our head, taking thoughts captive, out of the authority and victory and power of Jesus. Why? Because as he is seated at the right hand of God, which means, right, all authority under him, that means you and I are seated in Christ and we too have the same authority and victory and power that he does. He shares it with us. That means in spiritual warfare, you are never fighting for a position of victory. Never. You are always fighting from a position of victory. You're not trying to, to become someone who has authority. You are one who has authority in the name of Jesus. This is where the power comes from. You see, this is why this whole session really has been uh, not theole theoretical at all. It's absolutely practical because when we step into spiritual warfare, if you and I are not clear on these truths, we will not act in confidence, either with regard to our own thoughts in our head or with regard to the works of the enemy in other people's lives. It is by knowing the victory of Jesus and that we stand in that victory, share in that victory, because he shared it with us, that we can now speak confidently in any of these situations. Now, you might be wondering, and rightly so, wait a minute. If Jesus is above all things, and we're seated with him above all things, why does anything of the kingdom of darkness still exist? Why, why can't we come to any situation and like just wipe sin off the earth? Why can't we come to people's lives and just pray healing and all disease is gone? It's a great question. It's an important question. The scriptures give us an answer. In Hebrews 2, it says this. All things have been placed under the authority of Christ. Yet, we do not see yet all things being subjected to him. It's like, what? You just said all things are under his authority. Why then aren't they acting that way? This is the mystery of what we often call the already but not yet kingdom of God. We've got to understand this if we're going to make sense out of the world we live in and how spiritual warfare works for us practically. The best analogy I've ever heard for this is, uh, comes from a, a biblical scholar named Oskar Kuhlmann. He was a German scholar who had lived through Nazi Germany. So he was giving this analogy, I think, in the 1950s. And he said, the kingdom of God is something like the Allied nations coming against Hitler and Nazi Germany on D-Day. In this sense, a good military strategist would have told you that if the Allied nations can get the Normandy beachhead on D-Day, that, that, you know, get to the beach and secure the land at Normandy, everything turns for this war. That becomes the decisive battle that shifts everything in the Allied nation's direction and against the Hitler regime. So that battle became absolutely critical to the entire war. And when they did win that, that particular battle, in a sense, it was only a matter of time now before the Allied nations roll right into Berlin and put the Nazi regime completely down. But it did not happen overnight, right? There was a, at least a year-long period of vicious, bloody battles as the Allied nation is working its way to putting down the Nazi regime. And Kuhlman said, uh, this is very much like the situation between Jesus and the kingdom of darkness. At the cross, 
that the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus, that was the decisive battle that turned the war. From this point onward, we can say with confidence, Jesus has overcome the kingdom of darkness. But there's still um, that year-long period between D-Day of World War II and V-Day, when Hitler surrendered. So there's a period of time between the decisive battle of the cross and the day when Jesus returns a second time and completely puts down the rebellious kingdom of darkness. You and I live between those two days, the first and the second coming of the Messiah. We live during the time when we are moving as the kingdom of God through the earth, taking that mustard seed of the kingdom of Jesus and planting it everywhere. And there is resistance because the day Satan realized he was defeated at the cross, he didn't say to himself, oh, I guess I'll give up. No, in fact, oftentimes when you corner a powerful enemy and they see that their, their time is short, what they tend to do is they tend to get even more hostile and more vicious trying to take as many people down with them as they can before their demise. And that's basically the position of Satan now. He knows his time is short. He knows that Jesus will mop up this operation. And so he's in a, in a guerrilla warfare stance against us now, taking any pot shots he can at people. We're in an already, but not yet kingdom. Jesus has already had the decisive battle, but not yet ended the war. And that's why you and I live in a period where spiritual warfare is ongoing, intense, and absolutely essential for the Christian life. Praise Jesus that he's already given us the authority to do everything we need to do in this world, in this in-between times. God bless.